Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen. Welcome to the Block Crunch Podcast, the go-to podcast for investors and builders in crypto. And before we get started, just a reminder for you guys out there, the Block Crunch Podcast is intended for informational purposes only. Neither the host nor its guests are licensed financial advisors, and nothing discussed should be construed as financial advice. Views held by Block Crunch's guests are their own, and sponsorship messages do not constitute financial advice or endorsement. With that out of the way, let's jump right in. Today's episode is brought to you by Protocol Labs, the guys behind Filecoin. And with us today is Colin Efren from Filecoin, who can tell us a little bit more about what's one interesting way that people have used Filecoin to build. So Colin, take it away. Yeah, Filecoin has been used to store hundreds of petabytes of Web2 data, helping Web3 cross the chasm into what I would argue mass adoption. Developers have built onboarding platforms like Singularity, Estuary, and FileDrive, and more to mimic S3 interfaces and onboard data sets like genocide testimonials from the Shoah Foundation, New York government public data sets and large scientific data sets from universities like UC Berkeley. Within Web3, Filecoin has been able to provide redundancy for our top NFT platforms like Magic Eden, OpenSea, storing a large fraction of Web3's NFTs and secure gaming assets through Unreal Engine 5. Hello there. Now, before I move on, I'd love to thank the hundreds of you who have subscribed to Blockrunch VIP because with your support, I've been able to share my real thoughts on specific projects that I don't usually share on interviews in a format that I enjoy more, which is by weekly written posts. We've also been able to offer exclusive AMAs, sharing my investment frameworks, interactable models, and breaking down important trends before they become big. Now, we even had Elon Musk comment on one of our threads recently. So if you haven't already, head on over to theblockrunch.com slash VIP, and you can access dozens of hours of research for what you'd spend on a coffee a day. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. Now, this week, we're going to continue our exploration of the Filecoin ecosystem, who is a gracious sponsor of the show by talking to projects that are building using Filecoin. And if you've talked to me from as a project or as another fund or as an, uh, as an investor, you know that one of my biggest interests is in applications that actually attract real users beyond the crypto natives. And I'm constantly on the lookout for uh, products that are trying to launch into a broader market and not just built for us DGENs. And a lot of these products tend to sit on the intersection between Web2 and Web3. And one of the really interesting one that I actually came across way before uh, Filecoin became a sponsor, actually, a product that I stumbled upon was Cut Huddle, which is a video chat slash streaming slash recording application built on top of Filecoin. It's a Web3 native application, which I think is really interesting. And I personally used the demo as well with the founder, Ayush, and I had a great time just seeing the future of products like this. So um, I'm really, really excited to have the founder of Yush on the show to talk to us more about Huddle and how it's leveraging Filecoin as well. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. And it was great chatting with you. I think uh, five months back, we had a good chat on Huddle One as well, where we had a discussion on what we have been building. So thank you for having me. Yeah, definitely. So now for for those of the listeners who are maybe not by a laptop right now and can't click around on a demo, can you explain a little bit about what you're working on and what you're building? Absolutely. So Huddle Zero One is a communication toolkit for Web3, where we have a three-pronged approach. The first is what you mentioned very correctly. It's a proper DAB. Like it's a decentralized application, which is exactly like Google Meet or Zoom or Microsoft Teams, but uses all the crypto primitives like NFT as your avatars. It uses recordings, which is get stored over Filecoin. You can do all the things you can do on Google Meet and uh, Zoom uh, on Huddle Zero One as well. And it's just that you don't need to do it in a Web2 native manner. So for example, if you want to log in, you don't log in via your Google authentication, you log in via your wallets, or you can do a guest login. So now you can have much more freedom of expression, and then you can use your NFT as your avatars when you're having a chat, both as an AR and a VR filter. And then if you want to store those recordings, you can store those recordings very securely over two things. Number one, on hot storage over IPFS. That means if you want to quickly just store them, share the recordings with people, you can do that. And if you want to store the recordings for a longer period of time, then you can use Filecoin to store those recordings. If you want to live stream, you can use where we use something called as live peer as well. We can just live stream that call onto multiple places in one click. For example, on Zoom, you can do it only on YouTube. At Huddle One, you can do in three uh, at three places in one click. For example, on Twitch, on YouTube, or also on your, on your own player. So that increases your distribution at the end of the day. Uh, that's the first layer. We have done more than one million minute of meetings on the platform. 
uh, Mesari is one of our top, uh, I'll say, clients who uses Huddle One for live streaming cases. That means they want to do a video conferencing, then live stream over to YouTube. And a couple of DAOs, NFT-based communities, they love using it because of all these myriad of features. Apart from that, you can do token-gated meetings. That means, let's suppose if I'm doing a, a proper meeting if in, in a DAO and that DAO needs to have a uh, have their own tokens. So now, instead of using your own authentication system, you can use just do a proper token-gated meetings. That means if you have that NFT or that POAP or that Lens profile, you can just create your own custom filters and only those people can enter those meetings to who have those particular filters set. So now you have a much more, you're just adding that social layer on top of your uh, authentication without capturing your data. So that's the first layer of Huddle One. The second is the infrastructure. That means your SDKs. So now people can use our SDKs and build any kind of audio and video uh, apps which they want to build. So if, they, if they're building a decentralized Discord or a Telegram or a WhatsApp, they need an audio, video or messaging. So they can directly use our plug and play SDKs and build any kind of things they want to build on top of. And the third is the end game of Huddle Zero One. That's the protocol layer. That means if I use Jason and Juan from Filecoin are having a chat, and if Jason has a good internet connection, he can become a node and he can power the call of all three of us. So instead of uh, relying on a central server like AWS, we are right now using a compute and bandwidth of Jason, who also has a good internet connection, and he's the one who's powering the calls. So we are solving three things here, privacy and security, performance issues, uh, with having much more freedom of expressions. And third, at the end of the day, is your low, uh, like you are having a better economy. That means you are having a bottom-up economy rather than using a top-down economy. So value is captured by users, for users, and and yeah, that's the overall crux of Huddle One. We have been a team of 25 people now and uh, yeah, building strong for the last two years. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about conversations like this because, you know, for the past four years, so much of the attention has been focused on infrastructure. Everyone's building layer ones or, you know, messaging protocols and not enough people are building products that actually leverage all of these. And just from that first sentence alone, you mentioned kind of using Filecoin for storage for some of the video streams, using live peer to stream, uh, using Lens maybe as an NFT profile for people to sign on. I think that that's, that's just the beginning of the type of applications that we can see. So I guess a broader question that's related is, what do you think is wrong with like Web2 incumbents right now, like with Google Meets or like say Twitch or Zoom? Uh, you know, what, what can Huddle offer that, I guess, solves that problem that you see? Yeah, great question. So I think I'll just go back to the time when we started Huddle01 uh, back in ETH Global Hackathon 2020. Uh, the idea was pretty simple that everybody was talking about decentralization, Web3.0. And the meetings were happening over uh, over these uh, Web2 incumbents like Zoom and Google Meet. And this was the time when actually few of these players were actually facing a class action lawsuit for the privacy kind of issues which were happening. So the first thing will go on the layer of your, in, like the first click, that is your Google OAuth. You're authenticating yourself. For that, you're giving your email, you're giving your IP, you're giving your personal identifiable information. So that's the first kind of bottleneck which happens where your data actually is now not only yours, that's how you're logging into it. Uh, so that's the first layer. The second layer comes in the problem of performance issues. So the way the current architecture of video conferencing or the current architecture of communication is built, it uses a central mode of transfer. So for example, if you are in Singapore, I am in India, the servers are generally based in North Virginia and US because that's where the cheapest servers are. So all your audio and video packets are routed through a central server in US, and then it comes back. Now these packets are transferring via something called as, U these are UDP packets. They transfer via optic fiber cable by speed of light. And then it comes back to you and me. That leads to, and the more it travels, the more there's heat loss. The more there is heat loss of these packets, the more there is jitter, buffer, latency. So that's again the issue which happens. And that's a, that's something which you have seen in India a lot, which we closely saw because in India, a lot of the, the, the tier two and tier three cities where the bandwidth is not good. And when COVID happened, they had to go and stay at home and while doing their calls. So they has to use they had to use Zoom in tandem with their WhatsApp so that they could have because the latency was so high, they need to ask that, hey, what did the teacher say exactly? Because they the latency was so high, they were not able to even do the calls. Now it has such a spiral down snowball effect that now that rote learning happened for two years. Now imagine for a sixth grader not able to have a good conversation for two years with their teachers, that leads to such a spiral down effect of education. So performance is the second issue. And the third is that all the value which is getting accrued, that means the good conversation which we are having, all the value which is accrued is uh, captured essentially by two players, either the platform 
or by the centralized server providers like AWS, Azure, uh, GCP and stuff like that. So these are the major problems uh, on the level of the deep level problems. And, the, and if you talk about maybe expressions and stuff like that and new primitives which are out there, like for example, NFTs, which I believe is the most expressive crypto primitive out there. Now for you can now use your NFTs. Like we've seen a lot of schools doing that right now as well, where you can use because students don't need to uh, like use. Uh, they don't want to switch on their video when they're doing a call with their uh, with their teacher. So what they do is they switch off the video and then they are done. They're like, hey, I'm not doing anything now. Uh, but now when you have these kind of engagement things, where now you have a NFT as an AR filter, the engagement increases because they need a new kind of engagement metrics on how do we capture the attention of students at the end of the day. So that's where NFTs are adding a very interesting kind of value, which we have been seeing with a couple of schools, which we are testing out with in US specifically. Uh, so I think these are the couple of layers and then comes to the point of even the unit economics of the companies. Now, all the, uh, all the recordings which happen on education, it happens in any kind of DAOs or it happens in any kind of healthcare industries, all these these are very confidential data, number one, plus they need to store all these data for a long period of time. Now, if you compound those data over year, or like days over days, months over months, and years over years, it's a large amount of data. And AWS S3 is not cheap. It's very, very expensive. And that's where you require a better solution, which is much more cheaper. And Filecoin's negative price, the how they have developed their unit economics, the negative price storage leads to even uh, your price being virtually zero, like you are not actually paying anything uh, for storing such a humongous amount of data onto Filecoin. So I think this like obliterates or helps a lot of industries uh, like education, healthcare, even DAOs, where the recordings are taking place on a on a very uh, large level. And in general, as a whole, the three things which I mentioned from performance to privacy and to to the overall uh, your, your bottom of economy this will help in creating new kind new era of apps which are much more uh, which, which doesn't have a denial of service and which is not controlled by central incumbents and before we dive into how this is possible like how how you guys built this i guess what is there a trade off because it sounds amazing right it sounds like this is decentralized you can more efficiently allocate your bandwidth to uh, you know people on a call who may have more bandwidth and uh, you can increase retention or engagement for people using but is there a trade off with this is this like something that's very expensive to run or maybe it's it's it's, it's slower in, in some instances or yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. And this is something which we have been dabbling for the last two years. So as you mentioned very correctly on the first point, which you, which you said that the we have built a lot of infrastructures, a lot of messaging infrastructure have come into play. A lot of other infrastructures have been coming to play since 2017, but we haven't seen good apps built on top of. Uh, and the reason behind that, which I believe is uh, that we have a lot of research based assumptions uh, on which we build infrastructures rather than uh, user driven, feedback driven, uh, uh, data driven inputs. So what we did was that we built the infrastructure first, but we didn't open the infrastructure for public to use or for developers to use. We built our own app on top of our own infrastructure. So the first app on the infrastructure of Huddle01 was our own app. And once we built the app for the last two years, we focused completely on building an app, which is a, an iconic product in itself, uh, which can compete with the likes of Google Bit and Zoom, looks exactly similar. And in fact, has some new kind of primitives which people will love uh, to have a much better, I'll say, uh, much better drop off rate, a very less drop off rate because people are loving these new kind of experiences. So we started off with an approach of product first progressive decentralization. So right now at Huddle01, what you see decentralized are your authentication layers, your recordings, your live streamings. Uh, but what is still not decentralized completely is the audio and video. We do peer to peer calls for up to four people, but post that we still rely on central servers, uh, which is geographically located because we need to provide a better service. Now, over time, what we are building is something called as divergent. So now once we see that a lot of, so it's a game of demand versus supply. We were first solving a demand on the lay on, on Huddle 01 platform and the infrastructures. And over time, we'll do a proper slider instead of a switch. We'll, we'll, we'll progressively decentralize it because we are, the protocol is ready. And now we'll use it for people to run the nodes. So right now we're just checking that how protocol is performing as compared to the central servers. And once we see that the performance is comparable or even better, that's where we'll completely do that slider move. And similar to how an Apple iOS update from 14.1 to 14.2 happens, similar it will happen that, hey, we are having an update uh, and we are just shifting from central servers to a, a proper decentralized nodes. Yeah. God, and that's actually a really great pivot because I, I want to talk about the infrastructure that's making this possible 
Um, so can you briefly explain what is the decentralized infra behind Huddle 01 today? And you know, how, how does Filecoin fit in that picture there? Absolutely. So uh, for any kind of video, audio and video, there are a couple of layers which are very important. The first layer is your, uh, is your directly synchronous communication, that is audio and video, which requires uh, UDP packets. The second, which is a very important layer, is live streaming. That means you have to live stream these calls into multiple places. Uh, and the third layer is recording. So these are three major components of any kind of uh, audio and video kind of experience, which even includes asynchronous level of chat. So for audio and video, we use something called as WebRTC protocol. WebRTC protocol is something which has been developing since 2000. And th that's where we have started building with on WebRTC as a protocol. Then we upgraded the WebRTC protocol by writing, writing our own code in C++ to make it much more performant, much more lighter at the end of the day. The second layer is the live stream. So second layer is the live streaming, which uses something called as HLS and Dash technology. That's where we, instead of using the central uh, components, we use something called as live peer because they are solving for live streaming aspect of things here. So we use live peer where the encoding and decoding of this audio and video happens via live peer protocol, which is again in a done in a proper GPU based fashion. If Jason has a good GPU, he can become a uh, proper encoder, uh, a proper transcoder. He can transcode the audio and video in a much more methodical fashion. And the third uh, component is your recordings. So recordings right now happens over two places, either over AWS S3 or over Glacier. Now, the problem with that is again, denial of service, uh, extremely high costings, and that's where Filecoin comes into picture. And that's where all the audio and video, which is the intellectual matter of any kind of content of any human connection, uh, it gets stored over IPFS on the hot layer and Filecoin on the cold layer. On the audio and video part, which is the first layer, the WebRTC part, we, have, uh, we are upgrading from WebRTC to DRTC. That means decentralized real-time communication. So that's where Divergent comes into picture. So Divergent is our is our open, like it will be proper open, neutral, borderless, and decentralized and trustless kind of source where you can run your own Divergent nodes. It will be live in uh, by Q3 of 2022, uh, 2023, where now Jason or Ayush can run their own uh, uh, Divergent nodes. And by, by that, they can essentially do a proper uh, algorithmically routed uh, video calls where if we are in Singapore and if, well, let's suppose Jason is in Singapore, he can run the node himself and he can power the call of all of us. So that's the kind of uh, three-pronged approach we have on the layer of audio and video itself. Good. And, and why, is, why was it important to be able to store the data kind of decentrally? And I guess out there, there's like multiple different offerings right now. I think there's like storage, that's been around for a while, SIA for decentralized storage, Arweave. So what, what, why did you guys decide to go with Filecoin and IPFS? Yeah, great question. So uh, one thing which was very important for us was when we are storing over Filecoin, uh, the replication factor really helped us. The number of miners were so high. So once you're storing the data, it's very, very important that the data remains, number one, safe. And number two, there's like it's tampered, like it's proper, there's no tamper to be happening. And the, if any kind of thing happened to the node, there is a replication factor involved as well. So Filecoin, first of all, is one of the largest, like uh, it's doing, I think, more like 100x more than in terms of the storage as compared to R, which is coming the second uh, on the second, and then maybe uh, the third would be storage uh, there. So that's one of the reasons. Second was replication factor. So what we saw very easily was that I could have a replication factor of 10. That means if I'm doing a recording with Jason right now, uh, even if the recording let's suppose get uh, uh, like if the node some, somehow behaves uh, in a erratic fashion i'm still able to have nine more replication factors of it that means that data remains much more safer uh, here because now you have multiple duplicate copies of the data onto different places so these are a couple of reasons where we believe that that led to lower costings and also much more better replication factor which led us to completely go towards uh, the file going side Good. And I guess uh, as a caveat, as, as, as a tension to that, um, is it possible to kind of add some of these Filecoin or live peer features onto existing offerings? So what's the difference between, say, a Huddle 01 or, you know, adding, um, you know, adding Filecoin to like Zoom? Yeah, great question. So uh, in order to add Filecoin, we have done a very deep integration with Filecoin there on the infrastructure layer itself. 
so uh, the the it all boils down to the philosophy of how the web 2 and the web 3 business model works so the web 2 business model worked on the data collection that means authentication is the bottleneck uh, uh, authentication is how uh, the bread and butter of all the web 2 businesses work so in order to integrate filecoin into your own offerings you need to have an authentication which directly merges with uh, filecoin or filecoin virtual machine in a manner uh, that means it makes it composable and that's where we are actually also a part of filecoin uh, virtual machine hackathon so we are sponsoring that as well. and people are building on top of us they're using our sdks leveraging our sdks of hardlo1 uh, and building any kind of uh, they're mar- building marketplaces that means how you can store these recordings uh, of audio and video so they're doing a proper hardlo1 kind of a re- video recording they have made their own uh, custom front ends and then storing all those on to uh, filecoin itself now this is possible because of how the authentication mechanism has been designed now if you're using a google oauth it becomes very very tricky to essentially create that kind of a composable stack between your stack and between something like filecoin or something like life peer in between so that's something where the sdk has become much more composable where the main i'll say attack source is the philosophical thinking of how the authentication should work so without data collection or with data collection if you're doing a data collection you won't be able to have a composable stack yeah i see i see so basically the the design for huddle all one is just fundamentally different from a web2 stack you can't just take a web2 streaming or video call platform and just slap some web3 features on it because it is at the infrastructure level already decentralized absolutely yes Got it. And I'm I'm curious because um one of the most teased kind of features for Filecoin is the FVM, right? Basically creating this virtual machine where people can finally write applications on top of Filecoin and not just use Filecoin for storage, but you know, do fancy things on top of it. So is that part of the roadmap for Huddle as well? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh right now uh, it's been I think 10 days since the kickoff of Filecoin virtual machine hackathon has happened. Uh, and Huddle Zero is also a part of it. So what i believe is that uh, fvm will be so powerful because now with smart contracts you have you have programmable storage as well which gives you like a like a two in one kind of a offering for any kind of dapp which wants to get built so imagine you can have a programmable uh, storage uh, and that's what we are seeing at people who are leveraging even our sdks they want to have like they're building these uh, their own front end of uh, uh, of audio and video they're building their own web3 discords and then they're u- leveraging fvm to store all these things in a programmable fashion all the storage over filecoin so what you're seeing is a very high velocity of intellectual content of asynchronous chats or the synchronous audio and video getting stored over filecoin leveraging uh, the infrastructures of something like hardlo1 life peer and others so basically making it much more much data much more i'll say uh, intellectually uh, rich uh, which is getting stored over filecoin and this will happen at a very uh, very fast pace in the in the coming months. And I think this is where it's really interesting to get your take as a builder because this is not commonly understood because uh a lot of people see Filecoin as like a storage network but now there's a programmable uh, storage of programmable data. So what is the difference between say like programmable data post FVM and like non-programmable data and what type of difference does it make to you as a builder? So now since you have a programmable uh, proper storage now you are you'll be able to uh, now leverage all the kind of securities which were there on the ethereum so whatever things you are building and now get that in a single page uh, onto into filecoin itself so you don't need to go anywhere you don't need to uh, do extra additional efforts and that mental model that filecoin is just for storage gets changed there because now all the apps all the all the builders now know that they can get everything here on fpm itself so it's like you can build any kind of things if you have built anything on ethereum it's so easy for you to port because uh, like just add a uh, storage there because now you see that hey it's so easy for me to port because you get everything uh, because it's so much compatible now that you get everything which you wanted but now you also don't need to depend on s3 or glacier and now you can just uh, like smartly uh, code into the into your application that where do you want the storage to happen which kind of miner you want to get it stored on to this miner has a rating of let's suppose 4.8 versus 4.7 do you want to get uh, wanted to store there what should be the application factor look like what amount of storage you want to do uh, or how much uh, for how much time you want to do that storage on to all these things you can program now uh, that means you can just have a proper understanding of if you talk to me about in next couple of years your unit economics will become so much better for all these fundamental businesses because now you'll be paying so less because 
now you exactly know how much you're paying uh, uh, for uh, for the storage because you know that you need to store this for let's suppose 367 days. You can just program that, hey, store it for 367 days, replicate it for a factor of three, and then you're done. So you don't need to pay any additional costings, and now you can control everything uh, with the power of your code. Yeah. So that was from the builder's perspective. So from the user's perspective now, what kind of features, because given now that Huddle is already live, you know, it always has these Web3 integrations. So why does it still need programmable data? What new things can you do on Huddle after FVM? So now you can use Huddle One's, uh, I'll say SDKs, and you can build all those things that you want to build. So Huddle has two layers, as I mentioned, DAP and the infrastructure layer. So now what is possible for even us on the DAP layer is that uh, people want to store their data. They store their data days over days, months over months, and years over years. And now they, they have a dashboard. Now you can go to dashboard and you can select that, hey, I want to see my data of March 21st, uh, 2021. So now you can do that very easily. And it makes me so easy to store the data with, because now people have the power to how much time they want the data to be get stored. And now I can design my pricing model in such a very interesting manner where I can give them a such lucrative costings uh, on, on, the, on the storage layer, which is not possible fundamentally in the business model of Web3, uh, Web2. That means Zoom cannot doesn't give you that. They give you an offering of that, hey, you know what, I give you additional 50 GB of storage and post that they charge you based on per GB costings. Now, this is something which I won't be doing now because I have this uh, power of programmable storage now on the on the DAP layer. And on the layer of infrastructure, now it makes me so easy for people who are building on top of me. They don't need to like um, now uh, think about uh, storing the data over AWS or over GCP or over S3 and over Glacier and stuff like that. They have a one-stop composable SDK, but they're just, uh, there's a no-brainer for them. Audio, video, they can leverage Huddle One. Amazing because they can also le leverage Huddle One. And then if they want to store all these asynchronous synchronous data and, and just make sure that, hey, it gets stored over this much amount of time, they can just do that in a single line of code itself. So that's the kind of leverages which you get at the end of the day, which decreases the which makes your unit economics very, very healthy and your pricing much, much more competitive as compared to. So for us on the infra layer, we can compete very easily with something like Agora, something like daily, something like all these other uh, Zooms SDK very, very easily because our costings will become so much competitive and so much better that we can slash 50% of costings as compared to uh, the others which are out there. God, I love that there is a actual commercial need to be building on Web3 Rails because a lot of the companies we see, a lot of the projects out there are building a Web3 for ideological reasons. They think we got to be decentralized for the sake of being decentralized. But here there's a very clear cost saving case, savings case that you made, which I think is really, really interesting. And another really interesting thing that I want to dive into is uh, one of the theses that I had was that applications will you know, capture most of the mind share. So they should control most of the values, not the protocol layer. Um, and I'm starting to think that this is starting to be validated because we see a lot of applications verticalize and build their own infrastructure. So can you talk us talk to us a little bit about the decision to not just build Huddle All One, the streaming and call, a video call app, but also verticalize and build Divergent, which is the communications protocol build under Huddle All One that you just mentioned? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great point, something which I've been pondering, Jason, over the last two years. Uh, and the design decisions of building product has happened very methodically on how do we go about it. So what we started seeing, Jason, was that once we built the infrastructure, we used WebRTC completely. We, were, we hadn't decentralized it yet. And we started seeing that once we are using all these crypto primitives of NFTs, DIDs, verifiable, uh, verifiable credentials, and all these protocols like uh, LivePeer, Filecoin, uh, we started seeing that a lot of people are uh, are essentially coming on the uh, platform. They're loving it for the for the sake of the because you have a very good product chops. So the first thing which we re realized was that to build uh, if you if you have very good product chops because we come from a uh, web two world like from 20, before twenty twenty I was a product, proper product builder. So I've built a lot of products in my in my past. Same goes with my team as well. And that too in a high velocity Indian based consumer market. So I understood that what kind of how do you uh, solve the leaky funnel, the leaky bucket of uh, from the top to the bottom funnel. Uh, so for that, you need to have very good product chops. And what, what we started seeing was that a lot of users started coming, retention increased to around 40%. That means people were returning back again and again. And uh, and then what we started seeing was that, that hey, anyway, we're capturing so much value on the app layer. Uh, if we just build divergent here, we can just open up this infrastructure for other people to also build on top of it. So what happened was that infrastructure, which we have right now, um, 
we built the pm we built an app on top of it first as as well that was a very good validation that infra should be opened up for others and then we opened the infra for others and then we started uh, uh, doing this hackathon sponsoring hackathons with in eth india in fbm and just in the last two months that's where we opened the infrastructure we had around 67 projects we built on top of us and what the good thing about this jason was that since we already had built product first uh developers started using our infrastructure not because they just get grants but because they knew that hey these guys are builders they have actually built a product on top of it it was a testament that the infra works they are good solid they've done more than one minute, minute, minute of meeting so we get a lot of i'll say consulting or a kind of officers where the builders come to us uh to talk about that hey how do i build this front end rendering how do i essentially go from a low fidelity experiment to a high fidelity experiment in terms of my design decisions and stuff like that so i think this is working so we might reach a multiple pmf very fast and that will lead to a much more demand on the infrastructure layer so i think yeah that's how the decision came into picture as, as i started seeing a, a a move towards pmf on the on the dap layer itself yeah that is interesting to hear firsthand and I, I love to pivot a little bit away from talking about the product and infrastructure to talking about the growth side, because one of the things you mentioned in the beginning of this interview was that there's almost a 1 million minutes uh, streamed or used on Huddle 01. And I remember when we first chatted about five, six uh, months ago, that number was a lot lower. So what have yeah. been driving those many minutes? And you know, who are the people using this Web3 version of streaming or video calls? Yeah, great question. So uh, the people who are using it is, are essentially creators. They are essentially this, the people who love to have these uh, meetings, that token gated meetings, people who love to have, who do their office hours on a daily basis. And what interesting thing happened for us was we integrate with Cal.com. So Cal.com is a proper web, like a proper Calendly itself, an open source Calendly. And then we integrate something like Meet with Wallet. So a network effect started happening at a much more faster pace. So uh, people who were, who were adapted to using these scheduling infrastructures, uh, calendar scheduling infrastructures, that's where Huddle also started getting integrated on. So now when people are sending links, uh, because we are in link sharing business, so, so we share links, let's suppose uh, 3000 links in a day basis, Zoom shares uh, more than 10 million. So if we need to crack 10 million minute, uh, 10 million links, we need to have a scheduling infrastructure. So that's where we integrate with something like Meet with Wallet, with Cal.com, and all the people who preferred privacy, people who preferred pseudonymity, organizations who preferred who were NFTs, DAOs, creators who wanted to increase their distribution. Uh, that means something like uh, who wanted who streamed on Twitch uh, and wanted to stream on YouTube and onto their player on in one click. That was not possible on Zoom. So they essentially started shifting on Huddle One because not because it's a Web3 product, but because you can have multiple plethora of distribution in one click. So you can get three distribution. So if you go onto Huddle One right now, just click on tools, you'll be able to live stream in one click onto three places. You cannot do that anywhere else. So these things led to people coming on us using the platform and loving the overall experience. So that led to the, the jump in the number of minutes of meeting. So a couple of L1s, they've started using Huddle One for their uh, daily seminars, daily webinars, or, or all their calls because not because we are Web3 based product, but because they were able to stream onto Twitch or onto YouTube in one click itself. So that's how the engagement started. That led to even a very good, I'll say, inbound interest for the SDKs. So I'll say that our front end product, which is the uh, DAP layer, is leading to a lot of inbound leads for the SDKs as well. So and that's creating a very good, I'll say, uh, uh, proper inward network effects and inbound lead cycle for us. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So that, I think that that's a really uh, precious um, kind of lesson for founders out there that are building uh, Web3 slash Web2 products uh, and trying to bring them to a larger audience. Um, and I think that the question that a lot of people will have when they build these type of products is obviously you want to get to the first, say, you know, 100,000 crypto natives first, but then the goal is always to bring it to the next, you know, 200 or 300 million mass audience. So how will your growth strategy change when it evolves beyond, you know, targeting the Masaris of the world or the crypto natives of the world into targeting, you know, uh, just mom and pop Zoom users? Exactly. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very, very uh, good question and something which, again, we have been thinking deeply onto it. So I'll just give a pass of Huddle One. Huddle One started off, uh, though we had, so we integrated Filecoin way back in 2020 uh, when Filecoin was coming in uh, uh, itself. That time, retrieval is something where uh, retrieval was just coming into the picture, but we had done that. And what, what we saw as a very good market for us was education. So Huddle One started off with a product, product 
focused a web3 based product but focused only on the education market why because our our performance was better our audio video quality was better our latency was better and our storage was much much more cheaper and that's where we uh, got into the world of talking to people like an academy by juice and all these other big edtech organizations in india uh, the, so we started off with a market of edtech first not crypto native audiences and we wanted to do the sales cycle here do these things so what we understood was that it's a very very huge market uh, the next market like education is really really huge for something like hardlo one uh we're leveraging the power of filecoin on the infrastructure layer on the, on the recording layer so the next target of hardlo one is to move towards uh capturing and solving the, the main problem are two things only that number one is uh, uh, the performance issues uh, because people or uh, students connect from all over the world so the connections are not great uh, even though uh, something like starling will take years to have a complete distribution until that time you will not, will have a less late a bad latency and you need to record all those calls because of maybe kappa laws in us which require something like if a children is below 13 years of age you need to record those calls and stuff like that and something like uh, intellectual property of uh, the university itself so the second is your costings so those two are very important verticals which will solve for a huge market like uh, education the, the third market we are capture will be capturing is going after healthcare so something like hipaa compliance in us is very known for that means patient doctor confidentiality so when you're talking to a doctor you need to have a confidentiality when you're doing a and it, the market is huge for these online consultations and that's where you require something like filecoin uh, on the recording aspect we making it much more secure and something like hardlo one on the encryption layer that means it's end to end encrypted and it's getting stored over filecoin which is again cheaper and again cryptographically encrypted so i think these three verticals where i'm seeing after crypto natives education and healthcare will be humongous markets uh, for uh, for something like a, a composable uh, stack of hardlo one uh, uh, filecoin as well as lifepeer yeah Got it. That's really helpful, and I'm really excited to see products like this uh, take off. So, for people who want to, you know, actually check out Hardo O One, um, you know, what are the best ways for them to do this today? Yeah. So, if you want to check out Hardo One, it's Hardo One dot com. That's where we are live. Uh, the the philosophy or the thinking behind O One is. Uh, we wanted to take O1 because when we do a huddle, uh, let's suppose when we meet, we huddle in a in a proper group. But O1 is uh, is is binary. That means it's zeros and ones. And since you are meeting in an online world, zeros and ones. So that's why huddle one name came into picture. So you just type on huddle one dot com and you'll be able to find us. I'm also active on Twitter a lot. So my handle is Ranjan three one one eight. So happy to answer any questions. Happy to guide. Happy to chat. Happy to uh, discuss philosophies on how we should move. And yeah, that's about me. Awesome. Well, yeah. Thank you so much again for coming on the show and walking us through what you're working on at Hadolo One.、Um, again, I think this type of application is exactly the type of stuff that we need to have to kind of break out of the crypto echo chamber. So,、uh, wish you all the success and thanks for coming on. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the Blockchain Podcast. So, thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite apps. And in case you didn't know, this interview is also available as a video on YouTube. And if you tag the Block Crunch on Twitter this week and tell us what you liked about this episode, I'll be sure to respond to you as well. Now, if you'd like to go even deeper, we have a VIP tier where every week or so we write an in-depth research brief or investment memo on a project, and we'll have exclusive AMAs with myself where I answer all your questions as well. Now we already have analysts from some of the top funds and companies in crypto as subscribers. So if you're serious about getting an edge in crypto, head on over to theblockcrunch.com/vip to learn more. And once again, thanks for supporting the show, and I'll see you next week.